fetishization of the, the Queen's passing has been peculiar. We have nothing to do with the Queen. I rarely agree with uh, Julius Malema, but uh, on this note, I would say that he's onto something. Why do we have such a problem of leaders not preparing individuals who take over when they have left? Centered on the idea of the great man, right? the idea that the, the father of the nation should rule forever. And clearly, they don't want to let go of the reins of power. And obviously, they've done very well. If African leaders were able to bring young people in, provide them with opportunities to rise up through the political system, to give them meaningful economic opportunities, to provide them with education, then I don't think we'd be seeing uh, the kinds of turmoil that we see in some countries. And so, of course, you know, I think there, there, there needs to be an outlet uh, for their anger. And I think protest has emerged as the, as the dominant mode. What we have seen is that seven of the 10 most unequal societies in the world are African. And that includes rich countries like Botswana and South Africa. The greatest asset Africa has is its young people. How have you been? I'm very well, thank you. It's a beautiful time of year here in New York City. So just uh, back to teaching and uh, trying to do some research and writing and, you know, uh, living life. That's awesome. Um, how are your classes? Are you enjoying the classes? Oh, yes, very much. I teach at something called the Mark School of Public and International Affairs, which is the School of Public Policy of the City University of New York, which is the main public university in New York City. Um, so, you know, we have really wonderful students who, who run the city. They work in all kinds of fields. And I, I teach graduate students who are uh, working across all array of public and private sector positions. That sounds good. Um, well, so recently we have had, I think, uh, we had had the news, you know, of the queen passing away and people had different thoughts about it, right? And Julius Malema from South Africa said that Africans should not mourn or rather, you know, him and the South Africans should not mourn given the history that they have with the queen. And what was your take on that? Well, I rarely agree with uh, Julius Malema, but uh, on this note, I would say that he's onto something. I think, you know, the... Uh, Fetishization of the, the Queen's passing has been peculiar uh, to observe, at least. You know, I live in the United States. We obviously broke away from the, the British crown several centuries ago, but uh, the coverage of the Queen's funeral has been essentially nonstop. And this has been unfolding while one of our territories, Puerto Rico, has been suffering through a very devastating earthquake. And so it's surprising to me, or perhaps not surprising, but disturbing to me that the media has focused almost exclusively on the Queen. And we've heard very little about a countryman in Puerto Rico who has been going through so much. Oh, taking it back home, well, first of all, were you able to watch the funeral? Uh, I did not watch. No. Oh, okay. So there, there was, I mean, people have been posting memes and speaking a lot about it, but Africans, African presidents being on one bus. And people had very different opinions about it. And I thought it was crazy, right? I thought it was insane. And it just went forward to show how powerless African leaders are. I'd say that, you know, I think the, the sad part about it is that African leaders felt the need to attend in the first place. I, I'm not sure, you know, the Queen is not uh, the, the leader of, of the UK. She was a figurative uh, leader. And, uh, you know, the idea that she should be accorded the kind of respect that we might expect for, say, a British prime minister or an American president or you know, a South African leader, um, you know, is, is surprising. I don't think all of these leaders would have uh, traveled so far to, to, you know, to attend the funeral of a former American president, for example. And, uh, I think that shows kind of the, the lingering effects uh, of colonialism on, you know, many of our political elites who, who liked to be associated with the Queen and, and the royal family more generally. Yeah, because I also try and understand why they had to go, most African leaders, and it really doesn't make sense, right? And Julius Malema, you also spoke about how even the crown had a, a diamond that was stolen from South Africa, right? And this goes forward to show how we are still having the effects of colonialism, but we are still, I don't know, I think just kind of like just accepting it and taking it for what it is and also, well, going to Escota. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think in my own family, and you know, my family's in India, and there was a lot of interest in the Queen's passing. But uh, I, I think there's a huge generational divide, right? So for our, our generation, I'm older than you, but my, my generation, my parents were born under British colonialism. You know, they were born in the 1940s when India was still a part of the British Empire. 
And so of course, there's going to be some lingering attachments for that generation who are now in their 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, but you know that kind of romanticization of British royalty, I don't think endures with the younger generation. And I think Malema is very smart because many of, the, many of his followers are, are younger people and they don't understand why it is that the older generation fetishizes this old uh, corrupt uh, family in, in the UK uh, as much as, as they continue to do. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a huge problem and I think we have lots of problems to solve, but I didn't think this was going to be one of the problems that we have to solve. <laughs> Yeah, I think you know it's it's it is fascinating, but but I but I I'm optimistic that you know perhaps this is the last uh, uh, stretch for the the British royal family. I'm I'm, I'm deeply a Republican. I, I don't believe in monarchs. I, I don't believe that any human is uh, simply by dint of their birth should be elevated above others, and that is what the monarchy represents. And so I'm against monarchies, you know, in, in places like Saudi Arabia, places like Soto. Uh, but certainly also in, in much of Western Europe, which still has uh, some strange attachment to the idea of the monarchy, despite the fact that they're all democratic societies. I don't think monarchy and democracy are in any way reconcilable. So the TED talk that I watched, uh, which I really liked, and you gave your TED talk while you are in Arusha. So how did you find the place? How did you find Arusha? Because that's the place I come from. Okay, no, Arusha obviously is a very beautiful town. It's small uh, compared to Dar es Salaam, which is where yeah. I've spent uh, two Absolutely. years. Uh, so I have a, a soft spot for Dar es Salaam, but I, but I love I love the diversity. You, know, you travel from Dar es Salaam, which is hot and humid and on the coast, uh, and you go up to Arusha, and it's you know another world altogether. It's mountainous, it's much cooler temperatures, different culture altogether. Uh, the difference between the Swahili coast and inland Tanzania is, is vast. Um, but I think that's precisely why I've always found Tanzania is such a beautiful country to visit. Um, it's really quite extraordinary what you guys have there. Almost definitely. It's a, it's a beautiful country to visit. And were you there when Magufuli was still the president, the late Magufuli? Uh, yes, I was uh, I was there in the 90s and I was there again in the early 2010s. So oh, yeah. uh, I saw two different, two very different versions of, of Tanzania, but still the same ruling party. Yeah, it's still the same party. I don't think when we are going to change. I don't think it's anytime soon. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, let's hope. I mean, you never know. Uh, things, things can change rapidly. You know, that's what yeah. we've seen in many other countries. I mean, we saw that in Kenya, too, with, with yeah. William Ruto being the president and uh, Raila Odinga. You know, it's, it's hard for African presidents to accept when they have lost um, the elections. And I think we, we need to reach a time whereby if someone loses, then they accept the loss and move forward i think that's the that's the future but again i think there's a huge generational divide so if you look at even in kenya the fact that you had you know these figures who are in their late 60s early 70s um you know being the kind of only options sort of speaks to the domination that that generation has over politics across africa I mean, one of the interesting things that I, I i discovered in my research uh, is that africa has the largest age gap between its rulers and its peoples, right? It's something like 42 years. The average African ruler is in his 60s and the average African is 18, 19 years old. Um, so that's a huge generational divide. I mean, I live in the United States, as I mentioned, and we have our oldest president ever in office, Joe Biden, uh, and he is about 40 years older than the average American who's in their early 40s. So the average American president, the average African leader uh, has roughly the same age gap as the current American president has with the American population, uh, but he's actually the oldest American president in history. <laughs> um, so just to give you a way to think about it, it's it's, it's quite a, a vast difference in perspective when you have such older leaders and such a large age gap between you know, the, the presidents, prime ministers, and, and the population of these countries. And And these are the leaders who at times don't even understand the changes that are happening and they don't even see the need to adapt so it becomes a huge problem i think so i don't i don't think they can adapt i think that's the, the basic issue you know my mother is 75 years old and you know I, I love her dearly but i wouldn't want to put her in charge of the country um you know she's a very capable woman um, but there is something about leaving the stage and, and letting a younger generation come up and I think one of the big challenges is that many African leaders do not cultivate, you know, uh, their replacements. Uh, there's not as much of a desire to kind of give opportunities to young Africans, provide them, you know, chances to to learn how to rule. 
And so we sort of have to wait till somebody dies and then all of a sudden there's a, a skirmish for who's going to take over. And then usually it's somebody of the same generation as the departed leader. Um, and that's, and that's I think, a very unfortunate outcome. What we should be doing, especially in a place like Africa, which is the youngest continent in the world by far, uh, is really creating opportunities for young people who I think are going to be at the forefront of every major economic, political, and social transformation that is yet to come. What do you th- why do you think we have the problem of of leaders not preparing individuals who take over when they have left? I mean, why do we have such a problem? Well, I think there's probably a few things. You know, in some ways, obviously, again, because most African countries only gained their independence in the 60s and 70s, you know, many of these leaders were alive. Some of them were actually participants in the anti-colonial struggles um, as young children. Um, but at the very least, they they remember you know those days and. and they worked within a, a particular system, usually sort of nationalist anti-colonial parties, um, which were very hierarchical and very top-down and, and, and sort of centered on the idea of the great men, right? The idea that the, the father of the nation should rule forever. Um, and when the father of the nation goes, then it should be somebody who was very close to the father of the nation who replaces him. Uh, and I think that's basically what we've been living through, you know, across Africa, but also really across the post-colonial world for, for a couple of generations now. Uh, and that generation is having a hard time, you know, aging gracefully. I think they, they don't want to, to let go of the reins of power. And obviously they've done very well, right? So they may have started as colonial subjects who were subjugated and, and uh, oppressed by England and other colonial powers. Um, but, you know, their, their rise to power has been accompanied by a tremendous transformation of their economic position. These people have, you know, uh, become massively wealthy by global standards. And so I think there's just this huge disconnect between sort of their uh, perception of, of the, their centrality to the nation, their identification with the nation, and the reality that, you know, most Africans are young. Uh, and many Africans are not able to take advantage of these sort of opportunities or um, you know, really able to develop economically uh, because so much of the wealth goes to a very small set uh, of these old elites who, who have monopolized political and power. So do you think now, do you think that's why more young people now are taking it to the streets to fight against that and, and take power back? I think so. I mean, you know, one one statistic that I find to be very important is, you know, when I first went to Tanzania in, in 97, um, you know, it was a few years after Nerere. Uh, you know, it was a poor country, obviously, but it was a relatively equal country. Right? In 97, at least, I didn't see uh, huge wealth. I didn't see, you know, people driving around in Mercedes or BMWs, and, you know, huge land cruisers and, and other types of vehicles. I didn't see these big mansions on the beaches. I didn't see these fancy malls and restaurants. Um, so even as it was a, a poor country, it was a relatively equal country. And now if you go to Dar es Salaam, you, know, you see just tremendous wealth all over the place. And, and that wealth is not equally distributed. Right? So the, the statistic that I always find very revealing, you know, even though we don't usually think of Africa as being a, a, an unequal society, um, our unequal societies, what we have seen is that seven of the 10 most unequal societies in the world are African. And that includes, you know, obviously rich countries like Botswana and South Africa, which everybody thinks about when we talk about inequality, but it also includes some of the poorest countries on the continent, like the Central African Republic. Uh, and this is all relatively recent. So this is something that's happened really in the past two decades, as African countries have grown tremendously because of investments from, from you know, Asia in particular, almost all of that wealth is being captured by a very small set of the population, right? And that population, as we've already been discussing, is tends to be older, tends to be very connected politically, uh, and and young people, you know, across ethnic communities, across races, across genders, uh, have not benefited from the tremendous amount of wealth that has been generated in African countries over the past three decades. Um, and so, of course, you know, I think there, there, there needs to be an outlet uh, for their anger, and I think protest has emerged as the as the dominant mode. Again, to come back to what we were just discussing, if African leaders were able to bring young people in, provide them with opportunities to rise up through the political system, uh, to give them meaningful economic opportunities, to provide them with education, I don't think we would be seeing uh, the kinds of you know uh, turmoil that we see in some countries. But, but that's not what's happening. And of course, young people are going to express their anger in some way. And But do you think, because to be honest, I mean, empowering young people means them taking the risk of saying, hey, 
one day I'll leave the office and this young person will take over. But I don't think that's something most African leaders want. So there's also a problem in that. I don't know if it's a problem. I mean, you know, the, the greatest asset Africa has is its young people. I mean, you know, I live in North America. Yeah. I, you know, I travel to, to Western Europe. These are aging societies, right? Even if you go to East Asia, places like Japan, the, the populations are unsustainable. Right? They, they are not having enough children to, to replace their population through natural means. They're hostile to immigration, so they're not bringing enough immigrant, immigrants. And so what does this mean for any society? It means that you don't have enough workers uh, to actually fuel the economy, right? And this is a huge problem, especially for wealthy societies that, that that have very generous welfare benefits, because the way it works is that you know once you hit your 60s in the United States, for example, you receive uh, subsidies from the government. Right? We call it Social Security here in the U.S. Uh, and those subsidies are what you use to live into retirement. And you know, the system here is not that you go back and move in with your children. The system here is because you know it's set up so that you can live independently. Right? And, and many of these people don't even have children to live with in the first place. Right? But the system is based on the idea that younger people are constantly entering the workforce and paying into the system, which then gets redistributed to the older generation. And we're now reaching a point where you know, these, there's not enough money coming into, into the social welfare programs, especially for the elderly. Right? Um, and our politicians in the United States are not willing to let in enough uh, immigrants to make up the gap. Right? So, when I look at it, I, I don't look at young people um, as being uh, a problem to be solved. Right? I think they're a resource uh, that should be deployed, right? they should be supported. Uh, they, should, they are the future labor force of, of every country. And the only two parts of the world that are growing in terms of population right now are Africa and South Asia. Right? And they happen to be the two poorest regions in the world as well. Right? Uh, so long term, I do think there is going to be a, a big shift. But of course, right now, you know, we're living through this turbulent moment where, where there is this attitude, I think, amongst elites in Africa and same in South Asia, where they treat the youth as a threat that has to be managed, you know, usually through repression or through some other means, uh, and not as an asset that, that should be developed. Well, speaking about that in Tanzania, um, right now, getting, um, well, becoming a professor, getting a PhD, is very difficult. The system is very difficult, right? And I think it goes back to what you just said, they're trying to close people off so that they can keep their inner cycle small, right? And now we have a lot of graduates, right? College graduates. But then the problem comes when they graduate. It's like these people don't have job opportunities, right? So they would go back to the streets with their degrees. And Africa isn't doing a really good job when it comes to imparting young individuals to you know, start businesses and become entrepreneurs. And later on, you graduate more people than the jobs you can offer. So that also becomes a problem well, when you have more educated young people who are roaming the streets. I, I think that's correct. But I think that, you know, the, the solution is not as difficult as some leaders would have us believe, right? Um, you know, young people are, are, especially educated young people, are a tremendous resource. I mean, you know, in, in, in earlier times when, when you had a surplus of educated young people, you know, uh, across the developed world, across Western Europe and North America, those, those are the people who do the real labor in the United States and in Western Europe. If you go into any hospital, if you go into any uh, IT firm, right, uh, across the West, uh, it is filled with young people from places like Africa, from places like the Caribbean, from places like South Asia, who have been educated and who are arriving in these you know, advanced capitalist democracies and are providing a huge economic benefit. Right? And this is the big secret of immigration in the U.S. is that you know, the U.S. would essentially collapse if you didn't have immigration. I mean, almost all the top firms, whether you're talking about Google or you know, Microsoft or, or, or whatever, are, are run by immigrants. Right? And, and, and they are not there for, for tokenistic reasons. They're there because they are the best people to do the work. Now, the sad part is that they are not able to do that work in their home countries. And so the West is constantly you know, providing them with uh, opportunities that they're not getting at home. What would it look like if they actually had those opportunities, were able to devote those kind of resources uh, to developing their home countries? Uh, and I think that's the, 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 the real missed opportunity that, that many governments across Africa, across what we used to call the third world, uh, are missing, right? Is that they, you know, adopt these economic development strategies that are highly extractive, that are not about developing the, the human resources that are available, 
but rather about extracting natural resources that doesn't require a lot of labor and certainly doesn't require a lot of skilled labor. Right? Uh, and so instead, what you get are you know Asian investment, investment from the Gulf countries uh, that really is designed to to destroy our environments, to destroy our lands right? at the expense of the people. Uh, with really no role for the people in the in the in the economic model, right? uh, and I think that's why you see so much hostility targeted against you know rural communities in particular. You see what the Tanzanian government is trying to do in, in places like Arusha, um, you know, where they're they're really trying to push into the Serengeti now. They're trying to develop these extraordinary lands, uh, often at the expense of the local populations. Well, speaking about Asian investment. Um... It's something that still fascinates me to date. If you look at the investments that are being made by Asia to Africa, it's massive, right? And some people go to the extent of saying that this will probably be neocolonialism, right? Because the amount of loan that Africans are willing to take, it's massive to the extent that you can't even try and foretell when they'll be able to pay them back, right? And it's a problem that, I mean, I, I don't know if African leaders are seeing it as a problem, but... I am a bit worried with regards to the type of investment that is being made to China and, you know, the incident that we hear over and over again, you know, a Chinese man comes and, you know, marries someone and then beats them and kills them or just beats the employees and the way they treat them. It's just so cruel. And it's like, how far are we going to allow them to go and how far are we willing to be able to allow them to come in and invest? And is this something that we will be able to manage in the next 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Good. I mean, I think that's a very important question. And I think you should be suspicious of, of all this money that is flowing in and what it's actually doing to, to your country. Right? Because, you know, you have to ask yourself a very basic question. Why, why does a country want or need foreign direct investment in the first place? Now, in economics, the, the basic theory is that you bring in foreign direct investment uh, because that uh, stimulates investment. Right? It stimulates uh, um, uh, economic growth. Right. And what is the mechanism that that actually, uh, how, that, how does that actually unfold? Right. So the theory used to be that if you get foreign direct investment, you devote it to uh, setting up factories, industries, right, what we used to call industrialization. Right. And that those factories are better employment opportunities for the local population than, say, working in informal markets. Right. And the idea was that by you getting the foreign direct investment, you build these industries, these industries hire local labor. The local labor now enters the middle class, right? Uh, and that improves the quality of life uh, for all people in the country. So foreign direct investment was designed or thought to be uh, a key way to produce economic development. What's happened with the Asian investment, Chinese investment in particular, is not following this traditional economic pattern because almost all of the investment that is flowing into Africa from Asia, from the Gulf countries and elsewhere uh, is going into resource extraction. Right. It's not going into uh, promoting industrialization in the urban centers. Indeed, like places like Kenya actually have a smaller share of the population working in the industrial sector than they did in the 1980s. Right. That's extraordinary because if you think you know, what Africa's growth rates were like in the 1980s and what they are like today, where they've been pretty steadily um, you know, solid, um, it's extraordinary that you know, we've actually seen a, a deindustrialization. Right. Yeah, the fewer percentage of the population is actually working in the industrial sector than they did several decades ago. Uh, so foreign direct investment is not achieving what it's supposed to do. The only reason you or I, as a, you know, a citizen of these countries, should care about foreign direct investment is not because it makes our president richer, not because it uh, makes the ruling class richer. Right? It's be, supposedly because it's, it's going to make all of us richer. And that is not what's happening. Instead, as I mentioned earlier, it's instead, it's fueled inequality, right? Because almost all of that wealth is captured by a small portion. And so we see that, you know, this is, and this is the World Bank, right? The World Bank issued a report saying, look, Africa has had very high growth rates, but no reduction in absolute poverty. That's an extraordinary divergence because it used to be that you had to produce growth to reduce poverty. And that's not what's happening. And so with regards to the industrialization, <laughs> Well, that's that's tough. That's a hard one, uh, because we are in a century whereby you know those who have industries and manufacture more and more goods are the ones who you know they they have a competing opportunity, right? And for us, we are moving in the opposite direction, right? And 
yet we are receiving money that we are supposed to use for industrialization and we have fewer and fewer number of individuals working in industries and it's just it's it's tough and for example right we have massive arable land in africa and yet the war between um well russia's invasion in ukraine made africans <laughs> realize that they don't produce what they need to consume it's like well in as much as we have arable land that we can use to produce what we want we still rely on a country such as ukraine to provide food for us which is it's crazy it is crazy and i think again you know these these, these are not uh, uh, unavoidable you know issues right we, we know a lot and african scholars have always talked about things like agricultural policy things like industrial policy right and how governments actually have the power to implement policies they can protect the interests of African workers. They can protect the interests of African communities. And every time we sort of run into these sorts of issues, the fact that Nigeria has to import refined oil from Europe, even though it's one of the largest oil producers in the world. The fact, as you point out, uh, that many African countries are reliant on food exports from Ukraine rather than being able to produce uh, enough food for its own populations domestically, despite the presence of massive amounts of arable land. Suggests a massive policy failure. And that's the only way to understand. These are things that have solutions, they're just not being implemented. And so the question then is why aren't they being implemented? And again, I would come back to who is benefiting from the current one. Uh, and the, the ultimate sort of uh, struggle, I think, for African young people in particular is that this generation of leaders is very short sighted, right? maybe because they know they're going to die, maybe they just want to get as much as they can before they pass. Um, and they're not making sort of the long-term decisions uh, that would really help uh, the majority of the African peoples. And are the leaders learning from the protests that young people are taking on the streets? I, I, I'm, I'm generally optimistic. I think that it's important to pay attention to young people. And I think young people are, are raising issues that, that the, the leaders sort of hoped would, would just go away or would be ignored. Um, but I think that these things take time, right? I mean, I think our desire is always uh, to see change unfold very rapidly. I think as you are well aware of, um, that's not how it works. Sometimes it takes decades, right? And so these protests really began, let's say, in the past 10, 15 years. Uh, you know, and I think that it will be another decade before we, we, we understand their impacts. Right? Africa wasn't decolonized in a year. It took decades of struggle to kick the Europeans out in the first place. And that's the nature of how social movements work. It, it takes time. What I have seen, because I've been following many of these movements for over a decade now, um, is that you know the people who participate in these protests, not like when the protests fall out of headlines, that they no longer care about political issues. Participating in protest movements, participating in social movements is transformative. Right? So you see uh, you know, good friends who are, who are activists, they were quite young when they first you know, decided to take to the streets. They didn't know why they were taking the streets. They were just angry. They felt like something was wrong. Uh, they, were, they were outraged by something that the government had done or by the fact that their families were hungry. Um, and now 10 years later, they have emerged into sort of conscientious political figures. Right? And now they're in their 30s and they're setting up organizations, they're doing community work. They may not get as much attention as when you know, hundreds of thousands of people take to the street, but this is the real work of how you bring about political change. And the key now is that they are, are welcomed by governments, that government understands that protest is an elementary democratic right. And that there's nothing you know, uh, threatening about young people in particular taking to the street to express their dissatisfaction. That is how democracy works. Right? Instead, what I would like to see is governments reaching out to these protest leaders right? to, to say, hey, look, um, you know, how can we work with you? Right? How can we address collectively some of the concerns that you are raising and to provide them with opportunities to go from being activists on the street to potentially being members of the government itself? Mm -hmm. um, and that, to me, that would be what an enlightened, an enlightened government does. The first scenario is young people becoming disaffected, right? young people believing that they have no capacity to change their political and economic lives, uh, and then potentially being drawn into illegal activities uh, potentially being drawn into violent activities, that's actually much worse. So I don't look at activists as a threat. I think governments should view them as an asset. Right? That what you have 
uh, are fundamentally civically engaged young people who want to make their own societies better. And if I was in government, clearly I'm not, uh, you know, that, that's how I would want to, to, to approach the question of social movements. Is that, look, this is, this is great. It's wonderful that these young people are not joining militias or, or rebel groups. And they're actually willing uh, to try to make a difference you know, peacefully, nonviolently, in an unarmed fashion, you know, because the alternative is so much worse. But the problem is that these leaders see them as, the, as, I mean, as a threat, right? And they don't see them as individuals that they can work with. And how do we get more young people understand, well, that they have a role to play when it comes to, you know, the way that their leaders treat them and what they do? Because still, most young people are not really interested in politics because somehow they think they don't have any influence, right? And they somehow think that, you know, it's just a certain group of individuals that can, you know, work in the political space and, you know, help them. While in real sense, they're the ones who have the power and they're the ones who can change things. I mean, I think that, you know, the question of apathy, that's the, the word that we often use to describe people who don't want to participate in elections and so on. I think it's, it's incorrect. I mean, my, my understanding of young people is that they're actually deeply interested in politics. What they're, they're, they're apathetic about is the political system. And they're apathetic about the political system because they don't believe it makes a difference in their lives. So when you have politicians, uh, you know, who have been a part of the same political party their entire lives, uh, who mainly seem interested in, 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 in being involved in politics to benefit themselves or their families, right? uh, who, who, who view young people in particular as a threat, as we've already discussed, um, you know, who only allow young people the opportunity to participate in politics when it comes to winning an election. Right? Uh, and that election is usually two political figures who have been involved in the political system for decades, who have just shifted power back and forth between them. Um, you know, I, I'm cynical about that kind of political system as well. Right? I, I'm apathetic about that kind of political system as well. And I'm a professor of political science you know, because I don't see what difference it makes. Here in the US, we have this conversation all the time about how different the Republican and the Democratic parties are. And as somebody who's critical of both parties, um, you know, sometimes it can be very frustrating because you're always told that, oh, you need to choose uh, a moderate leader, right? somebody who can appeal to the other party. And as somebody who tends to be on the Democratic side of things, you know, I don't want a, a political candidate to come to office because he can appeal to Republicans. I want him to appeal to me. Right? I want yeah. to do things for me. I don't want him to constantly be like, no, we can't you know, uh, provide free education. No, we can't provide universal health care. No, we can't, uh, you know, do public infrastructure or allow for immigration because somebody over there on the right might be upset that we did that, right? But that is how the electoral system in the United States works. And it makes people, young people in particular, deeply cynical because you vote for these figures and you think, oh, there's a difference between uh, Hillary Clinton and, and Donald Trump. Uh, but then once these figures come to office, they, they tend to enact the policies that look remarkably similar. Right? And I think especially in the U.S. with the Democratic Party, we see a lot of that. Right? Um, whether it was Obama or you know, Biden, I'm, I'm, he's still early in power, but you know, I, I, I would like to see more from him. And it's always this, this, this language that we're told, oh, well, you guys just don't understand politics. And I, I get told this, I'm a professor of political, scientist, <laughs> political science, and I get told this that I don't understand politics. Right? that I'm being naive, that I'm being idealistic. And I, I, th I disagree. Right? I think they have bad strategy. I think they don't understand politics. They don't understand that if they want, you know, in the U.S., only about 40 to 50 percent of people vote for the president. That is a really low number. It's less than half the population, less than half the eligible voters who actually vote. And why is that? I, mean, I think, again, because we tend to see the two main political parties working in the interest of the same set of people. And those people tend to be wealthy, they tend to be white, um, and you know they tend to be concerned with things that benefit them. Right? And so if I'm choosing between two candidates, one Republican, one Democrat, uh, you know, who want to enact the same set of policies, regardless of which party they are affiliated with, it is going to make me very cynical. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I don't care about politics, it's just that I don't care for this particular electoral system that we have in place. So we have we have touched on a couple of stars with regarding to you know African leaders and the position that young people have to play in in politics and you know um, in helping themselves out right. 
um, and how it's it's very hard for you know the current leaders to give them an opportunity for them to express themselves and even take up leadership positions. And who do you think could be an ideal leader that could help the African continent right now? Because it seems like we have a lot of problems to deal with. Yeah, I think my my sense of it is that there's there's no shortage. Right? I, I think my ideal of, uh, uh, of an ideal leader is somebody who comes in with a specific mindset, who does the work, then leaves, goes back to their regular life, right? Whether that be a teacher, or a doctor, or, you know, and that's very rare. I mean, again, to come to the U.S. example, you know, most of our politicians are, are lawyers, uh, but really, what they are are professional politicians. Uh, they start working in politics as twenty-two-year-olds, and they spend the next fifty years uh, sort of hogging up the the political space. Right? Um, and I think that's a problem because I don't, I don't know if I understand politics as, as being a, a career choice. I, I'd rather it be a vocation, a calling. Um, and I think I have met any number of, of extraordinary African young people, right? uh, both on the continent and certainly you know, in places like Europe and North America where I live. My university has a large number of African students um, who are just brimming with uh, good ideas on how to improve, you know, uh, conditions in, in Africa and, and around the world, I would say, right? Um, and they're not given an opportunity because they don't have that sort of naked hunger and ambition uh, to simply be a politician for, you know, for personal reasons. They, they actually have ideas. And, and as we have currently set up our, our political systems, um, you know, we tend to reward the professional politicians. Right, somebody who becomes a politician simply to to get ahead, whether that be you know, status or to acquiring great wealth, um, and that's I think precisely the wrong set of motivations. Right? I would much prefer, you know, we had a a way into politics for young people in particular, maybe for ten years. Right? So if you're a teacher and you want to work on a specific issue around improving educational access. Uh, that you would have the opportunity to join government to work on a specific set of projects to develop an expertise, and then if you are satisfied with the work, that you are able to return to your position as a, as a teacher or, or as a farmer or any of these things. Yeah. Um, and and as you know, that that's not the world that we live in. We have these political parties that have youth wings that are recruiting twelve year olds, thirteen year olds into their into their political parties. Right. Way before that person has had an opportunity to develop any skills, way before that person has had the opportunity to contribute to society in any meaningful way, um, you know, they are they are kind of socialized into being a member of a political party. All that matters is whether their candidate wins. They're expected to do everything they can just to advance the interests of the political party. And I think that's a, a, a deeply tragic uh, model of politics and also a deeply anti-democratic one. Uh, and it's not unique to Africa. I want to say that. Like here in the U.S., it's, it's no different. You know, the number of politicians in the U.S. who are the children of politicians is disturbing. Right? We are a democracy. We come back to the question you asked me first about the Queen. You know, I, I hate the idea that a politician's child will become a politician. I think that is usually a, a sign of failure. Right? It means that child is unable to do anything uh, beyond what his or her parents have created for him uh, or for them. And you know, to me, that's exactly the kind of person we don't want in politics. <laughs> uh, I, I think that's an embarrassment that, 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 that the only career path you could choose is the one that your parents have given you. You are, we live in a democratic society. You have unlimited choices, right? Uh, and the idea that somebody who is the child of a politician has been given all the benefits and advantages that come with being the child of a politician uh, can only imagine a future where they become just like their parents um, you know, is more like a hereditary monarchy. It's not what a democratic society should aspire to, uh, and it certainly hasn't proven to be a particularly effective mode of governance. It's not like these people are, are good. Most of the time, they are worse than their parents once they do come to power. Um, so I'm against the very concept of it, but I'm also against like the specific cases that we've seen of where young people have followed their parents into politi politics, because most of the time, they are, they are worse than their parents were. And that's a low bar, most of them. Isn't that crazy how if your father or mother is a politician, then, well, you're directly a politician, whether you like it or not. And it's like, well, people accept you simply because your parents were politicians and yet, you know, 
you really can't do anything. And for most people, it's like, well, I become a politician so that I can rest and, you know, people can feed me and clothe me and everything else rather than them saving the people. I think so. I mean, I think, you know, it's, like I said, I believe in an opportunity society. I'd like to believe in a society that any person, regardless of how you are born, uh, has an equal opportunity to to succeed. I, I don't think that's a, a radical concept. Right? I think most humans, and I think most young people in particular, would agree with that sentiment. Right. Um, yet, you know, whether we're talking about politics or any number of other career opportunities that exist, we know that who your parents are really does matter. And parents will go out of their way uh, to ensure that their children are given you know, advantages uh, to be successful in their chosen career path. I, I think it's it's embarrassing. You know, I have a son. Um, you know, if he ended up being a professor of political science, you know, I, I wouldn't be happy with this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think he's much more interested. There's so many other things he could do. There's so many other interests that he has, and I want him to pursue any of those uh, with the full opportunities that are available to him. Right? And I would understand his inability to be successful in those other fields as as a failure. In some way. Of course, I am a professor of political scientist, so I can give him uh, some inside advantages. But should I? And to me, that's a deeply undemocratic instinct. The idea that I need to carve out a career path for my child, and then that my child needs to carve out a career path for his child. That, that's that's monarchy. Right? That's aristocracy. And, and there's a reason why all of our anti-colonial leaders, all of our uh, you know our political forefathers, were against it. It's why they kicked out the British in the first place. Right? And I think they were onto something. And I, I, it saddens me that they have essentially replicated that model of, of, of hereditary, you know. Uh, 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 politics uh, from from the British monarchy. That's not an ideal that anybody should aspire to in this modern period. And it's very sad because, especially in Africa, that's still a huge problem, right? Because your parents um, have they have a huge influence on the career path that you're gonna take, right? and that's a huge problem because at times they'll be like, "Well, you know." My son, my daughter, I want you to be a doctor, right? Or I want you to join the military, right? Or I want you to be an artist, whatever it is. And young people really don't have the options to do what they want to do and what they will ask and to become who they aspire to become simply because their parents have a huge influence on the career path that they're going to take. And well, they they say they respect them, but more it's more of like, you know, being afraid to stand up for what you want, right? It's like, if we can't even stand up for the careers that we want to go for, I mean, it's like, how the hell would we be able to stand up for for the leaders in, you know, the highest positions in the governments? I think that, you know, it, it is a tragedy at the individual level. Obviously, young people want to pursue different types of careers, and then they're forced into a specific career that, um, that their parents have chosen for them. But I think it, it's even deeper than that. It's a societal problem. Um, because, you know, uh, again, I love my parents. They were super supportive of my, my educational uh, uh, ambitions, right? and I'm deeply uh, appreciative of that for them. But what I'm most grateful for is that they didn't tell me what I should do with the career. They gave me freedom. I don't think they would have ever imagined that I would end up as a, as a uh, professor of political science. My dad was an engineer. My mother you know, worked in a flower shop. And, they, they had no idea what this world was, but they trusted me enough to say, okay, if you know what you're doing, if you are confident here, as long as you do it well, do whatever you want, right? And what does that mean for our us as a society? I mean, if you think about, you know, innovation as being a, a hugely important aspect of how any society develops, right? you have to trust that young people know what they are best at, uh, that they can identify, you know, areas that we may not know as parents, I'm a parent, as I said, um, and that there may be something that they are, are good at, or it's something that they understand about you know, the future um, that me as a, as a middle-aged man just doesn't see, right? And so my instinct as a parent is to say, okay, you know, I want you to do something well, but I'm not going to tell you what that is. And if you have a, a convincing narrative and you say, look, dad, I want to uh, pursue this thing that you don't understand, you have no uh, comprehension of, you know, you're unaware of, um, but I think this is where my future lies. I'm always going to be happy to talk about it with him, but I'm not going to take the attitude of, no, you must do what I tell you. Right? Because I think he will become an asset to society uh, if he pursues what it is that he uh, is passionate about, uh, rather than me forcing him into something that he doesn't care and is only doing because I told him that he has no choice. 
so I have a friend who went to college and he's now going to his second year. And there was a day I was having a conversation with him and he told me what he expected he was going to be studying and what he actually found. They are two totally different things, right? Because so the Tanzania education system, how it works is that, well, you choose three areas that you want to study and then and then the the the, the government allocates to you what you are going to be studying. Right. And most of the times, if, for example, you have the first option, that's what exactly you want to study. And then they probably choose the third option for you. So you are going to college not knowing what you're going to be studying. Right. So at times it's like, well, you are going to be learning in like things that are entirely new to you and things that you don't even understand. Right. And well, you don't even like. And at the end of the day, well, that's the career that people expect you to excel and it's like, in as much as you might have the option to, you know, decide the career that you want, but do you really have that option, right? So it's also another huge problem that we still have. Yeah, I think that's unfortunate. You know, I, you know, obviously I, I live in the United States and I did my, my degree here in the U.S. Uh, and the model in the U.S. is very different. And I think there's a lot of advantages. Now, obviously, you know, we are a much wealthier country here. Um, and so we have the, the resources to allow young people you know, more time in higher education. Um, but you know, the, the ideal to me is, is what we call the liberal arts approach. Right? And that is that if you're an 18 year old and you apply to colleges, you don't have to choose your, your course of study. You just apply to the college. And then usually your first and second years, you take courses across a wide array of disciplines. Right? Uh, and actually, you are required to take courses across different disciplines. So you have to take some English courses, some language courses, but also some science courses, also some social science courses. Um, and the idea is that, you know, you at 18 years old, you don't know enough about what you want to commit your rest of your life to. And by spending a year or ideally two years sort of sampling what, what the options are, then you have a much uh, greater knowledge to make an informed choice. And that was really interesting because, you know, you see these young people who come onto campus as a professor and they don't know what they want to study. Or sometimes they, they think they know what they want to study. And then they end up taking a course that, you know, they had no, they never heard of before. And they discover that they're quite good at it, that they are quite passionate about it. And what I would always tell my students is, look, don't overthink the major, right? Don't overthink what, what your field is. If you are passionate about something, if you're good at something, it's better to pursue that than it is to pursue a major that you think is going to be fashionable. You, know, you think that is going to get you a good job. Because again, what I have seen, and obviously this is not the same in every society, but at least in the US, is that if you excel in any field, you tend to be successful. And that's a much better approach than, than doing something half-heartedly. And I think that that model where you have to decide at, at 16 or 18, you know, what course of study you want to do, and then that will determine the rest of your life. Um, it's, a, it's a big burden to put on young people who, who are still trying to figure out who they are. Um, and I, and I, I, would, I, would, I would encourage you know, uh, universities across Africa, across the global south, to embrace a more liberal arts model, though I, I recognize the, the, the resource constraints that, that apply. If there was one African leader, a past African leader, that you think new leaders should use as a role model, or at least learn from the person, who would that leader be and why? Oh, that's a that's a difficult question because there, I think there's so many leaders in the past who I admire. Um, but the one I think, if I had to choose, that I think was the most intriguing to me, and let me be clear, he wasn't in power for very long, uh, so we don't know what his trajectory would have actually been, uh, is Thomas Sankara. <sighs> <Tana. laughs> I knew it was going to be Thomas Sankara. <laughs> I, I, Patrice Lumumba was even shorter. He had no yeah. time. I mean, he yeah. was barely in office, and you know, he was young, and he didn't—he you know, didn't really understand what he was confronting. So, I'm a big fan of Patrice Lumumba. I think he was a, an extraordinary figure. Uh, but Sankara is, you know, somebody who came along in the, in the '80s, and so he had seen, you know, what what happened to kind of some of his predecessors, and he had a much more sophisticated uh, understanding of the political scene. That he was entering into, and I think he was able to do stuff in, in Burkina um, that has had a lasting legacy. Right? Uh, and I, you know, obviously I, I've not spent time in Burkina Faso, so I don't know how people in Burkina view him. Um, but I've read a lot about him, and I've read a lot of his writing, and I find it to be just really ahead of his time. Um, and I would have loved to have to see, you know, um, 
what he might have been able to accomplish if he was allowed to, to remain in power for longer than he was. I mean, he was really ahead of his time. And likewise, I mean, I wish I could see what he would have done had he, had he been in power for a long time because the trajectory that he was going with was really a positive one and a strong one. And it's so unfortunate that every time we have a strong leader, well, they don't last. It's so unfortunate that that's the situation here. But, you know, I think that, again, you know, like I said, there's no surplus, there's no shortage of leaders. Right? There are just wonderful, wonderful young people across the continent who I think are ready uh, to be given the opportunity. So I always want to shift the focus from individuals to, to the system, right? um, because I think it's a, a failed system that is not cultivating this huge pool of, of young leaders who are, who are ready uh, to step in. Um, and so the, the, you know, as much as I mourn uh, the loss of someone like Lumumba or someone like Basankara, uh, you know, they were confronting a system that even as brilliant as they were, the system was still more powerful. And so we have to always keep our eye on the, on the system uh, and realize that until we change the systems, you know, there will be many more Sankaras and Lumumbas. But, but obviously what we want uh, is a world where Sankara and Lumumba are not the exceptions, but the norm. Absolutely. Uh, and that's, that's what we all must keep working for. No, that's true. They shouldn't be the exception, but the norm. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here with you.